British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has just announced plans to lift the cap on its nuclear stockpile, increasing the number of Trident nuclear warheads by over 40 percent. A new cap of 260 warheads. A few years back, the British government announced they would replace its current nuclear weapon system, Trident, at a cost of at least £205 billion. Pounds. In March 2021, it further announced they would increase its nuclear stockpile by over 44 percent. This is the first increase since the Cold War. All of the UK's current nuclear arsenal is capable of generating 1,500 times what happened in Hiroshima. And the UK wants to increase that by 44 percent. So in this video, we're going to talk about how nuclear weapons uh, are connected to the care crisis, the climate crisis, as well as feminism and race. There are more than 20,000 nuclear weapons in the world right now. This is enough to destroy the planet multiple times over. The threat of nuclear war and the threat of climate change exacerbate each other in three main ways. First, climate change exacerbates existing conflicts and creates new ones. Think, for example, of extreme weather, the degradation of natural resources, decline in food supplies, forced migrations, etc. All these events will add stress to the world's existing conflicts and create new ones. Second, as evidenced by a series of incidents in recent years, extreme weather events such as rising sea levels or major seismic events can directly impact the safety and security of nuclear installations. And third, even just a regional nuclear war could trigger a nuclear winter. With darkened skies, freezing temperatures, perpetual darkness and extreme cold in which all human life might end, it is known as nuclear winter. But let's contextualize a little. For example, look at Kashmir. Kashmir has been a site of tensions between India and Pakistan for very many years now. A new source of disagreement has come recently over the use of water from the Himalayas, which passes through Kashmir on its way to Pakistan. In 2016, the Indian government announced that it would create a very large dam in Kashmir. And Pakistan saw this as, as an act of war, as a violation of, of long-standing treaties and threatened to use nuclear weapons in retaliation. Pakistan's defense minister, Kwaha M. Asif, has issued an all-new threat. He said, and I quote, won't hesitate in using nuclear weapons if Pakistan's security is threatened. Many are looking Now, with extreme weather events such as severe droughts uh, only set to increase as we move deeper into the climate breakdown, situations like this have a high probability of escalating further, potentially into a nuclear war. Now take this as a fictional scenario. This is what scientists call uh, just a limited regional war. They've estimated that five megatons of black carbon would be released into the atmosphere. Uh, rainfall would drop, temperatures would instantly fall and the ozone layer would thin such an event would result in a global famine threatening up to 2 billion people. But also nuclear weapons themselves, without even being detonated, have an enormous carbon footprint. Trident uses a massive energy and resources in research, production, operation, dismantling and eventual waste storage. This is in addition to decades of environmental impacts caused by uranium mining and nuclear waste dumping. A particularly disturbing example of the intersection between climate change 
and nuclear development can be found in the Marshall Islands. Um, on Runet Islands, there is uh, an installation known as the dome or the tomb locally, which uh, contains more than three million tons of US produced nuclear debris and soil with lethal amounts of plutonium. And rising sea levels are actually making cracks into this installation, releasing nuclear waste directly into the ocean. Nuclear weapons are a threat to the climate and to life more generally everywhere. And nuclear disarmament is also a solution to the climate catastrophe. 205 billion pounds put into replacing Trident. It's, it's such enormous numbers, it's really hard to grasp what it actually means. But at CND, we've estimated that this is the amount it would take to install solar panels on every home or build enough wind turbines to power every household in the UK. Parts of London received a month's worth of rain in a single day yesterday, causing flash floods. North and West London were the worst. The floods areas. have caused huge disruption to the lives of thousands of people. And part of the reason why the UK found itself in this position in the first place is that it was really badly prepared. And it's linked to the fact that the UK's environmental agency, which is um, preparing for such events, has seen its budget cut by 50% since 2010. While the government has now pledged to double the amount it invests in the flood defence programme in England to 5.2 billion over the next six years, this is significantly less than the amount that it has pledged to use to replace Trident. That's not even talking about the 44% increase on top of it. Both climate change and nuclear weapons severely impacts the most precarious communities on our planet. So let's hear more about nuclear racism. generation survivor from what's known as the rest and desert region or from the language groups of Bidendera and Yanwendera. Um, I'm the youngest daughter of late Yamin Lester, who was very instrumental in calling the Royal Commission when the British nuclear test took place in our traditional lands on, in South Australia in, in what would have been seen as outback, remote and isolated. Um, was very much a part of our traditional lands and that did come out in the Royal Commission that those lands were used by Arnaudjurda, which is the term we use for Aboriginal people from that Western Desert region. Um, and so they are, you know, very important to us, these lands. Um, my late father and his people was exposed through the EMU Fields Test that took place in October 1953. Um, on the 15th of October was the first mainland test. And uh, a couple of days later, on the 27th of October, um, the second totem two was the second test. It was a very remote location, but those two tests had radiation fallout over our main community at a place called Walladjara or Wallatina, um, where many people were still living um, a, a very traditional life. And you still see evidence today because um, through dad's journey, he was able to secure parts of those traditional lands, um, which is the lands that we often go back to. Um, being based in Adelaide, I often travel up that way. And so it was also in the Royal Commission identified that was such a large area that one patrol officer had to cover to get out there and inform Arnaudjurda. Um, one patrol officer who didn't speak uh, Bidinyara or Yangunyara language, um, only spoke to many of the non-Aboriginal pastoralists and missionaries that he had travelled to. And I know through our Arnong oral history, 
that um, many remember this man, Mr McDougall, um, who had such a huge responsibility of informing Aboriginal people that they were going to be tested on um, back in 1953. So um, that was a, a certainly a huge task for one man to cover that large area. And so many of our people have been, um, I guess, put in the situation of... Um, one, not being informed of and getting the, or having the opportunity to give prior consent um, and to, you know, be well informed about what um, was about to happen. And there was a lot of, um, of course, communication barrier being, you know, one of the big key issues as well, plus the vastness or the remoteness of the state in South Australia where they tested for the first emu fields test. Um, due to that location, it later moved down to Maralinga in further south, which was closer to the railway line. And so many of the people down there were also relocated as well. So they relocated Aboriginal people and um, moved them into um, different communities, different, different regions and out of their traditional lands. That was a huge issue and many of them feel that today as well. Um, Soon after that test on Totem 1, many of the people in Dad's community started to feel the impact. So the tests were in the morning um, and by that evening, many became really ill. Our older generation really suffered and died from the exposure of that fallout from Totem 1. And, you know, many today suffer from those ongoing illnesses as well, respiratory issues to autoimmune diseases to um, skin issues and so forth. So um, one of the concerns from, you know, our Arnold community is the, the lack of ongoing support. And uh, that's what's been identified. And it's Article 6 of the Treaty to Prohibit Nuclear Weapons. Um, Article 6 outlines the, the need for assistance for nuclear victims or survivors um, and then also to look at the um, environmental remediation as well, which is a huge part and a lot of the story coming from that Pacific region as well. So many, you know, people within or First Nations or Indigenous peoples of the Pacific region were very strong about making sure something was put in there and you only have to hear the stories of um, you know, Marshall Islands and Australia and into, you know, Tahiti and the, the atolls and the testing they did, you know, the ongoing damage that's felt by the environment and, and by, you know, people of those regions as well. So that was a, a huge part of um, my involvement leading up to as civil society to go in there and to really speak for the Pacific area and to talk about the impacts that we are feeling from this. And this is generational and my personal family um, struggles have been for the last four generations now. And I just wanted to share the, an image of my grandmother's Gorbabiri um, Gungodjurda, just so people can have an understanding of this generational struggle and the fight that we've been going through. I'll start off with um, the image of my amazing grandmothers who um, formed the Gorbabiri Gungodjurda against the Howard government. Um, and they were very strong. And of those amazing old women that you see on the screen, um, only one is with us today. And, um, and an image of my late father, who was very um, instrumental in the Royal Commission into the British nuclear tests, and just really getting out this story from Aboriginal people. A lot of it's often seen that because it's out of sight, out of mind, that there is no real... Um, existence of Aboriginal people. It's part of the, the nuclear racism that we have felt that we kind of, you know, may there, maybe there, maybe not there, um, seen maybe not. So then let's test and let's, um, you know, let's, let's use this area of land. Um, there are those ongoing issues today as well. I think in, in South Australia, we have a number of uranium mines in our state and that's a, a huge issue. Um, one of the other issues that we are faced with also here in South Australia is the waste dump issue. Um, and that's been an ongoing thing. That's been something we've been fighting for for the last 
10 years. It comes and then it goes and now it's come back to South Australia and that is one of the, the huge issues that we have now or one of the fights that we have on our hands is um, blocking our national nuclear waste dump here in South Australia. So. Um, I'd like to start with a leaked memo, a memo that was leaked at the start of this pandemic, which um, was a cabinet office memo entitled the 2019 National Security Risk Assessment, which was signed off by the now famous uh, Chief Medical Officer, Sir Patrick Vallance. Um, in this uh, memo, the greatest potential threat to the country was, of course, an influenza type pandemic. Um, this had been the same in this document through previous years and time and time again the greatest potential threat to the country was identified as an influenza type pandemic. Uh, the document then goes on to list uh, a very similar scenario to the one we're now witnessing in great detail. Uh, it talks about multiple waves of the pandemic, a huge economic impact, um, how long it may take to get a vaccine etc. Uh, unfortunately uh, as we know, these warnings were largely unheeded and there was a real failure to prepare recommendations for stockpiling of PPE and plans for a contact tracing system were largely ignored until the pandemic began to take hold and even later. Meanwhile, as we also know, the 10 years of Tory austerity that had come before it really eroded the public services that we needed in order to deal with a pandemic of this time. Key bodies like the King's Fund and the Health Foundation were calling for a £1 billion increase in the public health budget. They only gave a £145 million increase, less than 15% of what was asked for by these uh, major health charities. So rather than the £1 billion that was needed in order to shore up our public health services, instead um, he gave £145 million. Um, now, this is clearly a, a simple question of priorities. Um, rather than fund our public health services, which we're now also so reliant upon, um, instead um, money was guaranteed for the military. And of course, as we know, 205 billion pounds worth of funding for the Trident nuclear weapon system. Now, this weapon system has been described as a monster by the former chief civil servant at the Ministry of Defence and it is clearly a huge drain on our public resources. And the question then must be asked why? Well, it's primarily down to pride. The British establishment and successive governments seem to be obsessed with the idea of Britain being a top tier military power. This is an outdated imperial obsession which is leading to clear failures of governance and therefore underfunding of things like our public health systems. Quite frankly, it does endanger the lives of us all. These conversations are beginning to open up. Um, there is a debate around military spending and particularly Trident with that huge, the colossal amount of money that is going into it. And we, as an anti-war movement, uh, need to take advantage of that and really challenge the uh, military establishment, which unfortunately does have a big hold on our country at the moment. First of all, when we talk about nuclear weapons from a gender perspective, there is uh, actually gendered harms from nuclear bombs, which I think a lot of people don't realize. It seems like these weapons are indiscriminate in terms of the harm that they cause, but um, scientific studies have shown us that ionizing radiation from nuclear weapons actually impacts women and girls' bodies differently um, and can have long lasting impacts on health. And so being aware of that is really important, I think, and gives um, kind of a new angle to this issue for, um, for some people. But I also think that um, for me, that's not kind of the most interesting or um, really urgent issue when it comes to a feminist perspective on nuclear weapons, because coming at this 
um, as a feminist means really interrogating what these weapons do, not just to human bodies, um, but also to our culture and to the way that we all exist in this world together. Um, and so there's, in addition to the gendered harms, there's also gendered discourse or gendered language around nuclear weapons that is really important to pay attention to. Um, some of you might be familiar with uh, the work of Carol Cohn, who um, is a feminist theorist who did sort of a deep dive ethnographic experience with nuclear war planners back in the 1980s and brought to the world's attention how sexualized and graphic the imagery and the discussion around nuclear weapons was um, back in those days. And while you know, the, the conference rooms in the United Nations don't necessarily engage in exactly that kind of rhetoric today. The implications are still with us. A foreign policy expert on the international level went to advise Donald Trump and three times he asked about the use of nuclear weapons. Mm. At one point, if we have them, why can't we use them? Oh, <laughs> Oh my, <laughs> what? Um, there's a lot of abstraction about nuclear weapons. Uh, they're talked about as deterrents. And so it makes deterrent into an object um, when in fact it is a theory um, and many of us would argue a myth um, and a misconception and a constructed idea um, about nuclear weapons. And so one of the most important feminist contributions to this field really is um, making sure that we talk about these weapons for what they are and naming them for what they are, which is weapons of mass destruction, weapons of genocide, weapons of terror. And this means that we need to be listening to people that actually have these lived experiences rather than um, those who are sitting in offices constructing theories in order to justify massive investments in these weapons of mass destruction. Another important thing that feminism really brings to the conversation about nuclear weapons is conceiving of them within the broader patriarchal militarist structures that we live and looking at these as weapons of dominance and control as tools of patriarchy. Um, they are used every day in order to exercise power through threats and violence. And so it's really an interrogation and confrontation of this idea that nuclear weapons haven't been used since um, they were used in Japan, but are in fact part of international relations and they are used in order to control and dominate. And then also another thing, that um, I think feminist analysis really brings to this is looking at the patriarchal techniques that are used to suppress or to quell debate around nuclear weapons and around nuclear abolition. Um, so techniques like gaslighting and victim blaming, which some of you might've heard in other contexts as being tools of patriarchy to sort of put down um, those who would argue that uh, nuclear abolition is realistic or desirable. I'm sorry to, I'm, again, I'm sorry to be annoying. I know it's annoying, my, it's my style. I just want clarity because no, I think it's incredibly, yeah, it's style, it's it's incredibly important to know what the Prime Minister of this country would do in terms of uh, defending this heard. country, right? You don't, think with, uh, you don't think with the Russians uh, authorising assassinations on British soil and the Russians being a nuclear power that one of the single most important questions for any incoming government and Prime Minister is how they might defend ourselves as a nation against a nuclear power. And again, I, I think just, one I of the simply, most important... I simply repeat to you, one Jeremy Corbyn. Decisions. If well, Jeremy I, Corbyn's you, prime minister, he's the, the only important. person. Jeremy Corbyn, yeah. if, you, if he's prime minister, John McDonnell well. is the only person in the country yeah. who can authorise the use of nuclear weapons. I just want to know if Piers it comes Morgan. to it. If it comes yeah. to it, and he is advised to do so, would he? Would he? Would he press the button or not? Um, and uh, the proponents of nuclear weapons. Um, use all kinds of patriarchal techniques against those of us who support nuclear disarmament. So accusing abolitionists of being emotional or of being irrational. I, I don't understand why everyone in this room seems so keen on 
killing millions of people with him. And then in terms of broader understandings of security, um, feminism has a lot to offer here. Um, there's been so much scholarly and activist work um, trying to redefine security from a feminist perspective to draw us away from the kind of traditional militarized conceptions where violence is about strength and power and where might um, equals right and those kinds of things where we need a lot of weapons in order to be safe and secure in the world and instead turning to feminist conceptions of security which are based on human well-being um, for as many human beings as possible not just those in a position of power um, and that can be achieved through dialogue and cooperation and through disarmament um, and through investments in things that prevent harm rather than cause harm. Here in the US where I'm living, there's been a real resurgence of the debate around abolishing police. Um, there's been a lot of uh, work, I know from many of you over many years to abolish militaries. And these are all consistent with the project of abolishing nuclear weapons as well. And in each of these avenues of work, we're looking to put money not into weapons, not into nuclear arsenals, not into militaries and war or policing, but investing in the things that prevent these types of structures from seeming necessary in the first place. Oh,